Hi, I'm Meta Spencer, and we're going to Essex, uh, University of Essex today in England, and we're going to talk with Matthew Gillett. Oh, I should have asked you how to pronounce your name. How do you pronounce it? You did it perfectly. Gillett. All right. Very good. Because when, when it's a G, I never know whether it's going to be a G or a Jill or, a, you know. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So it's, it's good, great to meet you. You are a man of many talents and uh, as I have served, uh, I suppose the most remarkable thing is that you've been a trial lawyer in the International Criminal Court in The Hague for, did you say 15 years you were I was in The Hague for 15 years, just coming up to 15 years, and of that was working yeah, as a trial lawyer, prosecution attorney for the majority of the time, um, and also had stints in Afghanistan with the United Nations and various other countries. But essentially, yeah, worked as a trial lawyer for the prosecution of the International Criminal Court for several years. Now, when you say in Afghanistan, did that mean that you would go to uh, the country that you were working on, such as Afghanistan, or were you? Uh, did you do all your work there in The Hague? Uh, the period that I was working on Afghanistan, I was actually there in situ in primarily Kabul, but also doing missions around the country. And I was there with the United Nations Assistance Mission, so doing human rights work, focusing on essentially trying to protect civilians from the impact of the sort of ongoing armed conflict that was happening at the time. This was back in 2016, so it was prior to the recent, let's say, change in um, who's running Afghanistan, uh, but it was still a period where there was a lot of conflict occurring and a lot of suffering on the part of civilians. And were you looking for bad guys or what were you... <laughs> Uh, what was your mission there? Uh, I can't imagine. You certainly weren't holding uh, trials or, uh, there, mm -hmm. I imagine. You must have been looking for detection of infractions. I mean, when I was in Afghanistan, it was human rights work. So I'd actually taken off my prosecution hat and mm -hmm. put on human rights. Fact. There's, there's some overlap between the work, but essentially what we were trying to do was address if we saw large scale patterns of human rights abuses. So, for instance, if people were being put in detention centers or prisons were being mistreated, were not being given sufficient access to medical care, food, or if there were beatings or even torture, uh, we were trying to intervene to to remove that kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. So it relates to potentially um, prosecutions down the road, but what I was there doing was not specifically related to the International Criminal Court in any way. Um, separately from that, in The Hague, in the Netherlands, that's where I was working primarily for the prosecution, and there it very much was about trying to identify people who were responsible for war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, um, which relates to human rights violations, but is um, it's a more, let's say, heightened test of gravity. So the, the really most serious incidents. Mm -hmm. And that, that work is more like the classical courtroom work that you would envisage with the accused in the courtroom and the witnesses come in and evidence, whether it's photos or videos or witness statements um, being presented to the judges. So much more courtroom work, whereas Afghanistan was much more field work, going out, um, visiting prisons, visiting local councils, that, that kind of work. Interesting. It sort of reminds me, I think, of uh, there were, used to be, or maybe still is, a, a TV show called Law and Order, where the first half was about the cops catching or pursuing the bad guys, catching them. And it turns the second half of the hour would be the prosecution and the, the legal team working on, on the case after the guy had been apprehended. So it sounds like you were doing uh, a sort of law enforcement in uh, Afghanistan, and then you switch to more the, the the second half of law and order <laughs> when you went to the Hague. Is that a fair way of putting it? Um, I've never been compared to law and order, but I have seen the show, and maybe I was uh, subconsciously influenced because 
I used to work, actually, um, originally I worked as a defense lawyer back in New Zealand, where I'm from originally, uh, for a brief time, and then switched to prosecution. And then, as you say, um, I've done a reasonable amount of work more in terms of what we'd say investigation, um, going out into the field, interviewing people, gathering documents, um, sometimes photographs, other, maybe going to scenes where crimes have allegedly occurred and um, seeing if you can find evidence. And so, so that I'd really see as investigation. And then prosecution is more the courtroom work and the, the written filings, the motions, the indictment, uh, we, we have sometimes different terminology, but it's it's essentially the same kinds of procedures. Mm -hmm. The big difference, um, you know, while we're talking about it, in the international courts, even though they're very serious crimes, you don't have a jury. So you don't have, you know, 12 of your peers. Uh, yeah, so whereas the common law tradition from New Zealand or Great Britain, which I'm more familiar with having that, that background, um, and America from what I've seen, you typically, if for a serious crime, you have a right to be tried by your um, fellow countrymen and so country people. So it's a, a jury. In the international courts, um, there are more of a mix of um, some aspects of both types of systems, but they don't have the jury. So it's the judges that sit there and decide the facts. And but there, there are several judges, right? Yeah, there are usually in most most international courts three judges who are going to decide at the first instance and then you have an appeal to usually five judges what what this means in theory is that the kind of argument you'd make to a jury um who will be lay people not necessarily lawyers are going to be slightly different you're going to um, try and explain things and you know much more clearly take your time over anything that's uh, more technical with judges, in theory, you can um, really focus on, um, you know, the expert evidence, the key technical contentious issues. Mm -hmm. So that's the theory. In reality, I, I, um, in many ways, there's a lot of similarities. And I think judges, like anybody, are going to use a mix of the head and the heart to decide a, a case. Um, and that's that's natural, that's intuitive, um, and you can't avoid that when you're dealing with, with humans. Um, but the international trials, the big difference is they go for quite a long time because you're, you're dealing with sometimes thousands of murders, um, might have hundreds of cases of rape, et cetera, and hundreds of thousands of people displaced from their homes. So you just, it takes a lot longer to get all the evidence in, to bring all the witnesses, and then you have to be prepared to wait quite a while for a decision. So they're not oh, fast turnaround. Oh, they right away as, as soon as, as other cases. I see. No, no. So they'll, they'll go off the judges. They will deliberate for months, um, sometimes quite a few months, before you'll find out. So it's, that's quite different from the domestic work that I was used to where, you know, the jury goes off. Sometimes they take a couple of days, or four or five days in a, you know, very contentious case. But... Um, Judge, if, if an international court issued a judgment in five days, I think people would be uh, very, very surprised. Mm -hmm. Well, is it that by by that their verdict is in a way setting law by creating precedents that, uh, uh, whereas uh, a, a normal criminal court case in in a, a domestic situation would not. Um, would not affect the law. Uh, are you are you building a law by adjudication? The way I would see it is filling in the details because whereas domestic system you have thousands of cases if it's um, drunken disorderly or even serious cases like murder you have a lot all the time. And so it tends to be that the law is pretty set and it's quite rare that a novel case comes out and really tests the law and requires um, some sort of interpretation. Whereas at the international level, just because each case is so idiosyncratic or so unique, um, there are almost always 
novel aspects to it that and because the amount of law that you have we're talking about a relatively young system and really 20 years old um is quite limited there haven't been that many cases i mean in the dozens of cases really rather than the thousands of cases so every case i've worked on has had novel aspects the judges are applying the law but in order to do so there's i would say more interpretation more of the filling in of the details than you would get in most domestic cases. Mm -hmm. And in the future, other lawyers might refer to the decisions and the, and the reasoning that they applied in that case uh, in, in arguing their case. Is that what yeah, might that's, happen? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's a very fair observation. And the judges in the written decision. So that's another difference from when you have a jury, they're not going to write down the reasons why they found the accused or the defendant to be guilty or not guilty. Whereas the judges in international cases absolutely will write down their reasons. And if they don't write down their reasons, that could be a basis for their decision to be overturned. They have to provide adequate reasoning. And all of the um, internationally recognized human rights must be adhered to in these international cases. So it's very important. You're, you're dealing with the most serious crime. Therefore, you do need to ensure that um, human rights standards, fair trial standards are rigorously adhered to. So to come back to your question, absolutely, the written decisions will serve as precedents for future cases. And some of the um, articulation of the law that has come out, particularly in some of the early cases. So there's a famous case from the, the tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, famous case of an individual called Dushko Tadic, and he was a relatively, you could say, local level, um, well, you could say thug, uh, convicted for various war crimes, um, crimes against humanity, um, in terms of violence against other people. But he wasn't president level. He wasn't like a general of the army. However, his name is kind of synonymous with some of the biggest legal developments of um, international criminal law because his case was the first one of the modern era of international criminal law. And so they had to determine the, the ability of the court to deal with crimes in various types of armed conflict. They had to determine the, uh, the legal um, foundations of the court. So some really critical questions were dealt with during his, his case. And that's uh, relied on in many subsequent cases and are now relied on in some respects um, at different institutions like the International Criminal Court or the extraordinary chambers of the courts of Cambodia, for instance, or the special problem of Lebanon. So um, there is a interconnectedness of all of these decisions across these international bodies. Now, uh, did I hear you say Kadich? I, I was thinking Karadich. We're, are we talking about two different people? Yeah, so two different, I said Tadich, Dushko Tadich, but Radovan Karadzic at the, let's say, chronologically other end of the tribunal's activities, so whereas Dushko Tadic was effectively the first case, so he was apprehended quite early on back in the mid-1990s, mm -hmm. Radovan Karadic was indicted and then uh, was on the run. So he was a fugitive from justice for, um, I think, 11 years, picked up around 2008, and then he was, um, he'd been in hiding, effectively. Yeah, I, I remember he, seeing pictures of him. Uh, you know, he was good disguise. He was a good looking mm -hmm. man, you know, very attractive person, if you didn't know who he really was. <laughs> well, well, I'm not, I'm not going to um, comment on that. But, uh, <laughs> he obviously, I think it's safe to say, had a certain um, charisma. I mean, you don't become... Yeah, yeah a president of a breakaway republic um, without some kind of stature. And it's, it's interesting, as you recall, he was assuming this persona as an, a sort of alternative healer, yeah. Dr. Drag, Dragon yeah. Babbage, yeah. and, and even made some media appearances. There are pictures of him uh, bearded 
with a microphone you can see in front of him whilst he was one of the most wanted fugitives on the planet on the surface of the earth so it's a it's an interesting story eventually tracked down captured um and then went on trial and he chose again interesting to represent himself now oh, <laughs> most really? people most people say uh, a lawyer who represents themselves is a fool for a client it's the, the classic adage um but for, for various reasons he felt obviously that um that was the appropriate approach and there is a, a um right it's not uh let's say without some exceptions but to self representation and so he had actually um also a legal advisor uh, peter robinson assisting him during the case but he was actually cross examining witnesses making arguments you know filing submissions so really acting as a lawyer in what at the time and may still be was um one of the biggest cases in the history of not just in international law but law generally yeah yeah well um, he, i mean you you knew that he was a smart man you had been a defense attorney in new zealand and i i'm just thinking it the of all of the situations in which cognitive dissonance must be painful being a defense attorney for a war criminal must be number 1 um and, and, and what's it like are are there people there uh, i presume how do they even find anybody who's willing to take on such a horrible unpleasant role the system relies on those individuals performing robust defenses making arguments ensuring that the prosecution is held to its burden of proof because the burden is on the prosecution to prove its case it can't just say oh look these events were terrible we need to hold someone responsible how about this guy no i mean and and i think that's really critical and something that um we shouldn't lose sight of of course in in these instances the difficult as you say cognitive dissonance i think um is that these international cases often will involve a large number of offenses and the accused person won't necessarily have been the one pulling the trigger or you know stabbing or hitting themselves some in some cases they were and i i worked on cases where there were direct offenders but the majority of cases are going to be high level leaders um who might be quite physically remote from the specific war crimes or crimes against humanity or even genocide so in some ways um that could make them um and i'm sort of thinking back to my brief experience as a defense counsel um clients that are quite let's say um intelligent probably if they're high functioning professionals they could help you as a defense lawyer construct your case fill in the gaps it could also make them quite difficult to work with because they might be used to giving orders and and not being told what to do and of course a client ultimately it is up to the client to decide um how they ultimately choose to go if they want to testify or not and you can advise them as a lawyer um but as long as they're not insisting that you do something that's sort of unethical or illegal you more or less ultimately have to go with what they say and um, you know at a certain point if you think that what they're asking you to do is unethical well, then you have to refuse yourself and say that you're no longer willing to but you will get quite some questions from the judges particularly if you try to do that you know after a case has started I, I, you would not be held in high esteem um doing that so so what is this to say with uh, sorry yeah. under what circumstances would you do this if you think your client well surely your client's going to lie to you you assume that right um i would say that if a client asked you to lie for them or asked you to allow them to knowingly lie on the stand um and it depends different legal systems have different approaches but certainly for new zealand there would be an ethical issue there um that you cannot knowingly present something that that you clearly are aware is false now it's different you you may have your suspicions about something they say 
but it's not for you as the defense counsel to sort of guess and speculate as to if they tell you, look, my defense is that um, you know, I was not present at the time. Here's my alibi. Here's the proof of my alibi. And you, let's say you sort of think, oh, um, interesting. But if you, if he's provided you with the evidence and you've got nothing concrete to say that it's, it's clearly wrong or false, then really um, your responsibility as, as the counsel is to go forward and, and present that to the court. Now, obviously, if you, um, if you know that it's going to be pretty easily torn apart by the prosecution, if you start to see that there are flaws in, in it, part of your duty will be to advise your client, hey, um, you realize that if there, is, uh, if there are people that, are going to say you weren't in the place you're claiming and that you were elsewhere, um, you know, that's something that's going to come up and the prosecution are quite likely to be aware of that. So you want to anticipate, but you don't want to speculate and guess because also ultimately it's for the jury and the judge to be the arbiters of, of fact and decide um, what has and hasn't been proved. And so, you know, your job is not to like your client. Your job is not to unassumingly accept everything that they say is is sacrosanct and absolutely true, um, but your job is to represent their interests robustly, fairly, but also ethically. Okay, you're actually answering questions that I've always had, not about international law, but about law in general, because there is this thing about lawyer-client privilege where you don't have, you don't have to be as frank as you might otherwise be somehow as a lawyer. But, you know, if the guy says, yeah, I did it. Now you go defend me by saying I didn't do it. Then uh, where are you? Can, can he do that? <laughs> or does he have to tell you, no, I didn't do it. And I'm not going to explain to you how come it looks like I did it, but you figure it out. Uh, I mean, now, now we're getting into um, the real issues of you know, ethics and law, but in, in the scenario that you pose, if he says, I did it, um, and I want you to defend me and say I didn't do it, you're quite likely in a position where you can't really represent that client. Now, it depends on what system you're from, and I'm not familiar with the, the rules in every single legal system, of course, but if defending that client would require you to put witnesses on the stand that you know are lying, you know full well, um, you certainly would be in an ethical quandary and you would, at that point, I think most lawyers would withdraw and say, sorry, I can't represent you in that way. If you say you did it, I can represent you by trying to do plea and mitigation, reduce your sentence to what we think is appropriate. Um, also, and, and this shouldn't be overlooked, sometimes clients think they did something and actually the reality is a bit more complex. They might have um, psychological issues. They might have reasons to claim responsibility for something beyond what they actually did. So it's sometimes um, not the end of the story, but in the kind of black and white scenario you pose, yeah, that would be one for recusal. No, people don't. In other words, the, the, the criminal almost never says, yes, I did it, but now let's plead not guilty. Um, I, I, I'm sure it happens. Again, my experience was relatively brief in this respect. I would say that generally, if someone says um, they didn't do it, but they want to plead guilty, for me, that would be a major issue, and I would say, if you didn't do it, we're not pleading guilty. Um, you know, I'm not having a client plead guilty to something they didn't do, I think that would violate your basic duty. Um, vice versa, if they say they did it, um, but they want to plead not guilty, well, you might ask them, because um, they might not actually, again, understand. And you might say, well, um, either you <laughs> recuse immediately because you see what's going on, or you might say, well, what do you mean? And they say, well, yeah, I, I hit the person but they hit me first and, you know, and I couldn't escape. And you say, oh, okay, yes, you hit them, but you might have a, a self-defense 
um, argument here. So actually they might have misunderstood the law and then you could advise them as to the law and, and start to unpack it that way. So it, it's really a case by case type of analysis. I think at the international level, it becomes uh, very interesting. And again, my experience is much more with the, the prosecution um, in that respect. So- Well, um, I would think in, in those cases, the, the 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 deck would be stacked in favor of prosecution because you don't get to go to the international criminal court as a, 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 a you know be prosecuted unless they've got pretty good evidence that you did it right well, you, you certainly would hope that the evidence is reliable credible and that it's not going to disappear at the same time, there, there have been acquittals, um, several acquittals, and including at the International Criminal Court in cases which maybe were presented initially um, in the media as sort of quite fait accompli, quite good. And then problems can arise sometimes with, um, I mean, there could be ultimately uh, misreading of the evidence, it's possible. There could be witnesses getting cold feet. Um, political situations in countries can change, and suddenly witnesses are much less uh, willing to say what they had told you previously when you were taking their statements. And if the key witnesses are not going to turn up to court and come up to brief, well, your case can collapse, and it has happened. Um, you also have to be aware of the, the passage of time and witnesses memories cloud they disappear they may um, change their views they can also get a little bit um, potentially influenced if they start reading a lot about um, the events talking to other people their, their memories might get muddled with these other people's or other sources then you have quite a difficult situation uh, disentangling those those pieces of evidence so that's where, and what we're seeing now um, is increasing efforts to obtain uh, what you could say like digital evidence, cell phone records, um, photographs, text messages, radio intercepts, these kinds of things, because they're difficult to obtain, but once you get them, as long as you store them properly, they're, they're, they're frozen in time effectively. And in some ways, they keep talking um, even as witnesses fall by the wayside. Uh, there are certain, for instance, intercepted radio communications from the Srebrenica cases in Bosnia in, in um, July 1995, which when you first look at them, they're not very clear in their meaning, but as um, the judges then were introduced to the various witnesses and the satellite photos and the other events, these intercepted radio conversations became really important. They could start to tell, okay, this is the nickname of such and such a commander. This is them telling the other commander that they have all these prisoners that they need to get rid of using coded language. But it became, it became increasingly clear and a really important aspect to proving what we were able to prove genocide um, with the killing of around 7,000 Bosnian Muslim men and boys uh, during that period. Mm -hmm. So those kind of alternative sources of evidence, and nowadays um, with the sort of post-analog world and digital evidence and um, many conversations being, uh, and, and activities being recorded in some way or another, mean that in conflicts like Syria and other locations, you're gonna have huge amounts of digital evidence and, it's almost gone, the pendulum has swung from having um, very little evidence of that nature and relying on witnesses to having huge amounts of digital evidence and then needing the skills. I would imagine a lot of that would be cell phones, people recording things on their cell phones, right? Nowadays, yeah. everybody's got one. It, it can be really amazing, yeah. How many people have cell phones and other devices and record um, explosions, uh, riots, protests, demonstrations, mm -hmm. uh, attacks sometimes. And when you piece together the different footage from different angles and periods of time, you can sometimes create almost like a um, reconstruction of what happened. Mm -hmm. So that can be hugely powerful. It, it does have its potential um, drawbacks in terms of 
you have to make sure you've you verified the sources, that you haven't um, misunderstood what's being shown. You know, a video has a start and a stop point, and you don't necessarily see what happened outside of those points. So you, there might be a very relevant event that occurred five seconds before someone started shooting. How do you um, assess and analyze mountains of data and, and sort of Facebook messages and Twitter messages and videos with a relatively limited team and, and also people that there aren't that many people with you know the mix of skills, uh, forensic skills and digital skills to be, and also case knowledge and situation knowledge to go through all of that um, in a relatively quick time because you you don't want these cases languishing and taking years and years to prepare. But also so that, this would not be something that a lawyer would necessarily be particularly skilled at doing. You want some sort of, uh, you know, tech guy. Uh, also language skills. You know, Finland speaks and understands um, Arabic, obviously. That's going to be very important. Cyrillic from Russia, um, different scripts from different parts of the world. That's going to help a lot. Uh, in terms of accessibility to where well, you can have huge amounts of evidence that otherwise might not really get discovered until quite late in the piece. And that can cause the you know, misunderstandings as to what actually happened. Someone sitting at home can actually uh, obtain and discover huge amounts of information just by intelligent searches, figuring things out, looking through various platforms. Um, which is very different to you know, even 20 years ago. You, you just didn't have that same level of access at your fingertips. I have heard, to my dismay, uh, people at least three or four years ago, maybe not so much lately, major criticisms of the International Criminal Court saying it's not an effective outfit that I guess some of the, the objections were that at that point, anyway, they had, were basically only specializing in, in capturing uh, Africans, for example, or people who, you know, clearly it's true. They certainly haven't put the U.S. on trial yet, and I don't think they're going to for a while. But I've heard people really say that the whole thing is um, it, it doesn't have the kind of legitimacy that it should have to be a really um, recognized world court. So it, would you say the ICC is struggling or would you say that's uh, an overstatement? I would say the International Criminal Court has not had a smooth path in its first two decades of operation. Um, there have been pitfalls along the way the uh, number of cases has not been particularly high, and it's been a, a mixed bag of, let's say, some trials. And I don't want to say that uh, conviction equals success and acquittal failure, because I think that's too simplistic. But I do think where trials uh, fall apart and evidence is not even able to really be obtained, and also where you have outcomes going from a conviction a trial to a uh, much more contentious split acquittal on appeal with judges going different ways, it does send uh, an indication that uh, it's been a, a rocky road. And I think the court itself has, has recognized that in the last couple of years, it had a large review process. Um, and I think that was a, a reflection of an awareness that there were ways that matters could be, could be improved. In terms of, um, you know, and I'm, I'm certainly uh, not particularly um, well situated to, to give a detailed comment on the court simply because um, there are so many aspects to it. So I can only offer my personal views. But uh, the, yeah, the early cases at the court did emanate from the African continent. And, and part of that, as I understood, was that a, there were some pretty serious conflicts occurring there with high numbers of casualties and victims of really serious crimes. Um, and being a number of countries 
themselves asking the international court to come in and investigate. So for instance, Uganda. Um, then you had the United Nations Security Council referring, for instance, Libya and the Darfur situation from Sudan to the court. So these haven't, but since then, um, I think you, now where you see the court uh, investigating in Afghanistan, uh, in the Philippines, although that's temporarily on hold as it seems, um, there's also uh, proceedings look to be commencing in, in Venezuela, in South America. So there's a, now there's a, a broader global scope, um, and uh, and there's also been efforts to look at the Arab-Israeli conflict um, and the situation there. So, so there's a broader coverage. The risk of that, and it is a real risk, is overexposure that they just um, draw themselves out too thinly. And ultimately, it's uh, it's one institution that is only ever going to be able to handle a handful of cases at any one time. Um, they only have a limited number of courtrooms for a start. So physically, so one of the key aspects, and I think this is an area that does require um, considerable work, and there is some there's some positive aspects in this respect, um, is complementarity. And the idea of complementarity is that domestic states in whichever country the crimes are occurring, take the burden firstly on themselves to deal with these cases and investigate and, and help um, try and support the victims. And it's only if those cases, those countries are unable or unwilling that the International Criminal Court steps in as a fallback mechanism. Realistically, that is the way in which it can have the biggest impact, is um, as a reinforcement mechanism. You mean that just the fact that the ICC could uh, intervene or t take action is enough to pressure countries to do it on their own who wouldn't otherwise do it? That's the, I, the theory behind the court, is that it encourages them to, let's say, clean up their own backyard before the court has to intervene. Again, the risk being if the court gets dragged in too many different directions, um, inevitably quality will be hard to sustain across you know, huge conflicts in various parts of the world where for each conflict, there are thousands of victims, hundreds of thousands. You do need a, your teams for all the prosecution, for the judges, for the defense team. They need to understand what's happened there. And in order to do so requires resources and time. And so, and also it involves proceedings there having witnesses travel often from a different continent to The Hague in the Netherlands, which they've probably never been to before in many instances, which is not ideal. It takes the case away from the natural seat of justice, which is close to the events. Um, so ideally you will have nat national systems dealing with those cases themselves and, and even more ideally, you'll have a diminishing number of cases and, and people can focus on, let's say, regular offenses that are going to unfortunately continue to occur. But um, ideally, we don't have war crimes and crimes of humanity and genocide in the future. Um, but obviously, there's a pretty high risk those will continue. The one other point I wanted to say since you raised the topic is um, the countries that have not signed up to the International Criminal Court um, do include some major powers, obviously the United States, uh, Russia, China, amongst others. And for the universality and the, I would say, impact of the court, that does make a difference. Mm -hmm. um, sure. It cannot be denied that um, not having true universal coverage, I think, um, complicates the work. If a witness is based in a country, for instance, that's not party to the court, already just at the practical level, you've got issues. Putting aside the fact that you know, if, a, if a major um, uh, commission of crimes occurs in a state outside the court's jurisdiction, you can't do anything. It doesn't have the power to just assume jurisdiction itself. So, so you know, ideally, I, I think most people would agree that war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide, um, aggression, that these things 
there really is no excuse for, there really is no reason to support these things and that every state um, should have a strong interest in ensuring that they don't happen again and that people are held responsible. Well, of course, and the so US really, uh, yeah. administration has, as I understand it, always argued, well, our guys would be, they'd pick on us and accuse us of all kinds of bad things. Well, of course, I mean, if you did it, you should be accused. But it's it's like, well, we should be exempt from this kind of treatment. We, you know, whatever. I, I just, I'm, I'm shocked at the argument that anybody would have the audacity to claim, well, we, you know, other people should maybe get prosecuted, but our folks shouldn't. And I think that um, the principle of complementarity that I mentioned before is really critical in that respect because it can convey the idea that, sure, you might have your own particular legal processes, um, constitutional rights, for instance, that you want to ensure, and that that is fine. As long as you engage in serious investigations and prosecutions, that they're not just sort of window dressing, shielding exercises, as long as that's done, then I think the court, and, you know, as an observer, so you, would be a good thing for the court to stay hands off and, and allow systems to deal with these matters themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really critical. But yeah, as you've, you've alluded to, there is a um, potential suspicion as to these processes. And I think that the court can help itself by regularizing its cases as more and more cases go through. And as the, you know, the procedures become more settled, I think um, all states will start and their, their diplomats and their decision makers will um, start to see that this is a court of law, it's established properly, it's staffed um, by you know, professionals who are competent and are there for the right reasons. And that in turn will build confidence and, and hopefully encourage states to sign up, at least the ones that haven't yet signed up. I should say there are over 120 states that have signed up. So it's, it's not it's not like a minor, small number who are driving some, you know, particular agenda. It really is no, but pretty it, global it's already. Basically, the <clears throat> the P five that that haven't isn't that true? I'm I haven't counted them. Which am I? Well, far off? the UK, the UK and France have signed up. So most of like Europe is there. A lot of I mean, I think the African countries comprise the biggest numeric number of states. Most of Latin America, um, New Zealand, Australia, um, a number of countries in, in Asia. So there's, there's a pretty global coverage. Um, it's just there are some significant uh, non-signatories, uh, and, and that does make a difference. And, and it would make a huge impact if even just you know one or more of those major powers signed up. That would make a big impact. Okay, now your work lately has turned to uh, cases that are not traditionally part of the war crimes uh, uh, situation. That is, you've been looking, I think, at crimes uh, in, of with the, the international law regarding cultural property or something like that. Like if a, if, if a belligerent attacks the artwork or the monuments or the churches, of their adversary, that can be uh, called a war crime, right? That's a very um, a marginal uh, kind of thing, isn't it? Uh, talk about that because I think you've done more cases that it, or you, tell me how that works because I'm not even sure uh, how clear it is that, that such uh, an attack on the cultural uh, heritage of a, of a group, it can be unequivocally considered a war crime. And, and then I wanna talk about famine briefly, but, but mm. tell me about your work along those lines. Yeah, I, I would um, disagree with you to a certain degree there in that attacks on cultural heritage, even if physically might just appear to be um, the destruction of bricks and mortar do have quite a significance because these sites that are 
cherished, that are held to be symbols of groups of people, are important not just you know, for the physical shelter that they provide, but also for the life of a community and for the historic existence and the future existence of a community. So the, the reason I say this, um, and I think what we often see is that attacks on cultural heritage occur as part of a pattern of other offenses. So mm -hmm. a, a population is expelled and then, for instance, you know, what we saw in Bosnia, mosques and other religious sites, um, but the examples I, I recall being mosques are destroyed. And we even had you know, witnesses, for instance, saying, well, from the, the perpetrator group saying, well, we knew if we destroyed their mosques, they wouldn't come back. So they effectively, we would have secured the territory for the foreseeable future. So I, it, it does have a significance it also is a fact that um, very significant cultural locations outlast all of us. I mean, we're only, <laughs> we have a certain finite life on this earth, but culture persists, hopefully, and it's something to be, um, let's say, uh, rejoiced at and to be encouraged and preserved. That's okay, what I was really I, looking I, for. I, I don't want to argue that it's a good thing to go around destroying other people's churches. I'm just asking whether in, in the history of the development of customary law that it's well established that the destruction of cultural artifacts can, is considered a war crime in the same sense that mowing down civilians with a machine gun would be considered a war crime, maybe. I mean, you're right to draw the fact that executing a group of people, particularly civilians, is a horrific offense and it's very serious and very well established executing prisoners of war or civilians has a long history as part of the Hague regulations, for instance, in 1899, 1907, through to the Geneva Conventions after World War II, and then the additional protocols. But if you look back, you'll also see in a lot of those instruments, uh, there is a prohibition on destroying um, and attacking buildings dedicated to religion, to the culture, to arts. So it, was, it actually has quite an etymology and a history. And I think um, part of that is that in ancient history, what would often happen is the sort of sacking of these cities, and we would see, the, you know, the destruction of great libraries or the um, taking away of loot and booty from these these amazing cities, and that um, even from a relatively, let's say, early stage of modern international law, that decision makers were aware of that serious risk in armed conflict and wanted to prevent. Soldiers, you know, you can imagine when they seize a town or a location, immediately entering the museum, smashing symbols of their of the vanquished people. So, so that, that has been something that historically is um, prohibited, and um, yeah, it does have a long history to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, but in, let's talk about famine. I had expected that's what the, we would talk about most of the time. Uh, and one of my reasons is that, you know, our project, Project Save the World, uh, tries to focus on six real threats to humankind that could destroy a whole bunch of people, millions, uh, in short order. And a, a good famine is a, one of those things, one of those six things. We haven't found that many people to interview as I understand it, the people who specialize in hunger and uh, the, the, the problems that cause food insecurity in general uh, are not the, not the same people who specialize in studying famines because famine is almost always, nowadays anyway, a, um, a, the result of some sort of deliberate um, aggression, uh, an attempt to uh, starve some group into submission. And therefore it is addressed mainly by people working on war crimes and other similar crimes against humanity. But <clears throat> here you are, somebody working on that. Yeah. Now, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I interviewed Alex DeWall, 
who has a book called Mass Starvation and several books about famine. And at that point, he was he was sort of on a campaign to uh, urge um, the development of more international law that would specify that the deliberate induction of, of uh, famine, <clears throat> mass starvation would be uh, a crime against humanity or something of the sort. I don't know where that stands, whether there has been a strengthening of that law or not, but tell me uh, how uh, such a thing, uh, what, it's, what its standing is now as an international law and, and how it can be enforced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the specter of famine and mass starvation is something that unfortunately has emerged or re-emerged, you could say, in recent conflicts, despite this, this sense, let's say, around the sort of late 1990s that that was something of the past. Um, and, and in terms of the legal position, um, intentionally starving civilians during armed conflict is a violation of international law that has been established for um, several decades. Now, at the same time, for various historical reasons, that had been limited to international armed conflict. So between state A versus state B, when it came to the international criminal court. So we actually recently in 2019, um, uh, along with many others, advocated that this should be remedied and it should be a crime in non-international armed conflict, so civil war as well as international. And the, they amended their own statute. So now that is reflected in both international and non-international armed conflict. So that was, that was an incremental step, but quite a significant step. In the, the broader picture, though, that you touch on is, it yes, it can be a war crime where you're intentionally starving civilians or depriving them of necessary foodstuffs, livestock, uh, the necessities of life, but it potentially could also be outside of armed conflict. So it could just be in the context of um, a very repressive regime preventing people from accessing the food they need. Uh, and that could be a crime against humanity that can constitute, if they're dying, obviously crime against humanity of murder, but it could constitute um, a form of torture. It could constitute what's called other inhumane acts. Um, so there are various, it could not constitute what's called persecution. So that's at the criminal side. There are ways, and it could, it's at its worst level, be a form of genocide, slow genocide. Can, can, you, can you think of a case that, uh, or uh, allegations of, of a situation of that kind. Uh, I, I don't know of any instance. The, the situations that uh, have been, let's say, raised in recent years have been the um, in the situation of armed conflict that comes to mind. Uh, blockades and sieges in, for instance, in Syria and Yemen, and there's been international let's say, human rights commissions of inquiry who have concluded that some of those blockades, either on land or at sea, have been um, carried out in such a way that they prevented people from having food and resulted in widespread hunger and, and potentially famine. And so those have been the findings to date. Now, it's interesting if you look at the criminal manifestations in the case you mentioned earlier, Radovan Karadzic, though he was not specifically convicted of sort of starvation per se as a crime, but he was convicted of various other crimes. And one of the key pieces of evidence was um, called Directive 7. And it's interesting in Directive 7, um, so it was, a, it was a strategic order, let's say, to the military forces. And that said that his forces should um, unobtrusively restrict the issuing of permits and reduce the limit of logistics, basically for the United Nations to be able to provide resources to the Muslim population within these protected areas. So I'm, I'm summarizing. But so there was an aspect of cutting off essential supplies, and that was 
relied on that was found to be a piece of evidence um, against a part of the broader pattern of crimes. So there are examples. I have friends who lived in uh, Sarajevo at that time and uh, who, who uh, were virtually starving. Uh, I don't know anybody s has said that the intention of, of, of the siege of Sarajevo was to starve the population, but would that be uh, possibly considered as, as a case? The siege itself obviously has multiple motivations in terms of um, there's a geostrategic motivation, there's a military motivation, there's potentially like a what's been found in some of the judgments, a punitive motivation um, against the population, a persecutory motivation. Now, when it comes to proving starvation, it's uh, a question, as you say, of intent. And intent, if I think about it from a prosecutor's perspective, it, hardly ever is someone going to write down, uh, let's go and starve population X. Instead, you look at their conduct, and particularly if the UN, if other bodies, the World Food Programme are telling them, hey, this population is starving, we need to provide them with essential humanitarian supplies. And if, if the, let's say, perpetrator group are saying no, but not giving any reasonable basis as to why, or the reasons they're given are shown to be faulty or disingenuous, then, yeah, you could start to say what they're doing really here is, is dual motivation. Of course, they want to win the war, but they're using the starvation of civilians as one of their tactics to do so. And historically, that was a, a common tactic. I mean, a siege, if you cut off a citadel or a town's source of food from the outside, eventually the population and the, the soldiers therein couldn't fight anymore and can yeah. sustain themselves. Famine in places like Yemen and now Afghanistan is a, a real threat and it affects a huge number of people. Um, and there's been recent reports on that that are deeply disturbing. So I just, I did want to make sure I mentioned that. What uh, What is the issue that you are addressing in particular uh, with respect to famine as a, a war crime? Yeah, so the recent work had been focusing on amending the International Criminal Court's jurisdiction so it could deal with cases in civil wars, non-international armed conflicts. And now in terms of um, awareness raising, so for instance, I wrote a, a piece uh, that was put online about the, the risk of starvation in, for instance, Yemen occurring during COVID, during the pandemic, and being overlooked because understandably, your know, governments and people are very concerned about their own health scares and problems. Um, essentially, it was a plea to not forget about the population of Yemen, um, where mm -hmm. the food supplies have been extremely restricted. And now, as you say, um, you know, I'm looking now at the situation in Afghanistan, having been there and just to say briefly that Afghanistan was highly dependent on foreign aid. That has largely been cut off. And who are the, the victims and the people that lose out? Well, it's the, the population and, and usually the most vulnerable amongst the population who are now selling all their earthly goods, um, unable to scrape together um, much money to even really live from day to day. So I think that's a very serious risk on the horizon. Indeed, tragic. Thank you so much. This has been absolutely fascinating. It's very, very rewarding. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank you for your work on these Im immensely important issues. So bless you. Thanks so much. And thank Bye. you for the um, really perceptive questions and um, happy to talk and happy to meet you. Wonderful. Bye-bye.